All right, this next talk is by Tobias Tobik. <laughs> Stop laughing, that's not helping. Um, uh, yeah, so Toby from... Uh, <laughs> now I'm done. Um, so next talk by Tobias Hackslip update. Hackslip. Uh, okay, thank you Tobias, go on. Um, so hi, I'm Toby. Um, you might know me from GitHub as um, Toby L four SK or from uh, from Discord from the Hacks Discord as Crobes. Um, and I've I've been using Hacks for um, about two years and a half, and I've kind of just been uh, at the beginning. I started uh, being interested in Hacks due to game dev, but nowadays I. I do a bit of game dev still, but I, um, I kind of just use hacks as a, uh, a hobby where I can just like pick up an issue somewhere, um, and just work on it. Um, so one of the things that I've been working on, uh, is also, uh, hacks lib. And this is what this talk is going to be about. So I've been, uh, making a few contributions, um, because, uh, hacks lib is, um it's been kind of left um it's kind of been abandoned which i'm gonna discuss on this next slide um so the last official release for hackslib was in november 2019 and it wasn't even a proper hackslib release it was just a release on github so most people have probably never seen it um and most people just um, use the version of Hackslib, which comes with their compiler. Um, and the worst, um, the worst thing is, is that the uh, the last version of Hackslib, which is uploaded onto the database, is three point three point zero. It was published six years ago, and it's got the wrong license as well. Um, so yeah, like. There are a lot of signs here that suggest that Hackslip has gone, um, has kind of become abandoned. Um, luckily, Andy has been working quite a lot. To, uh, whenever like the Hack server, Hackslip server comes um, breaks or anything, um, he would be the one to thank for getting it back up. So it's not completely um, unmaintained, but um, there's not a lot of new features that are coming to it. Um, so one of the features that are lacking and that a lot of people would, uh, a lot of people complain about is, uh, is dependency management in Hackslip. Um, so we were asked to put in memes, um, but this is a, a real issue. Um, even in Jonas's talk, uh, he had to, uh, specify exactly which dependencies he was using for his project in one of the slides. Um, and that's because Hackslip doesn't really have a good way of uh, automatically doing that so that you can just download a project and automatically have the good, the correct dependencies. So, um, yeah, so this is one of the things that I wanted to look into to see if there was anything that could be done. Um, well, right now, there are a few things that make it kind of possible to manage your dependencies. However, uh, they don't really, um, they don't really amount to much. Um, so it's possible to, uh, we saw this in Jonas's talk as well, you can have a, um, a local repository. So that just means that uh, the copies of the libraries that are downloaded um, in that project are going to be local to that project and none of your other projects uh, will interfere with those copies of the libraries. So you can kind of be sure that there won't be um, like any interference and that you'll be using the versions you're, you're meant to be using. Um, however, this, this doesn't really, this has, uh, this has the issue of, uh, the fact that you're going to have to have, um, if you use like heaps, uh, for example, in every game that you have, then you'll have, uh, a copy of heaps in every single project. 
um, even if you're just using the same version of heaps. So that's a bit annoying. And uh, so that makes it a bit uh, not ideal. Um, another solution is that you can actually specify exact versions of libraries in XML files. Um, sorry, HXML. Um, so in these examples, you can see you can do it with uh, hackslib versions, which are, so this would require uh, the library sumlib to be uploaded onto hackslib with a version of 3.2.0. Um, and you can also do it with git versions, which have a bit more information. So you can specify a branch. Um, however, this only really, um, well, this would, this would allow you to install the libraries from HXML, from the HXML, uh, which you can actually do with Hackzip. Um, however, um, like, unless you do it every time before you compile, you can't like a hundred percent be sure, um, that it's using that exact, um, version, especially with, uh, especially with Git or mercurial dependencies. Um, another, um, another feature in Hackslib that kind of allows, uh, dependency locking is that libraries, um, hex, hex libraries can specify dependency versions. So for example, um, uh, if we had, if heaps depends on format. So if, um, if the people who work on heaps decided that they want, uh, for, uh heaps to be used with a very specific version of format, then they can specify that version in the hackslib.json file. Um, however, the problem is that um, um, hacks can only include one version of a library per project. So if there was another, another library that also depends on format, but wanted to use a different version than, um, than heaps, then we we'd get a problem because the library versions would conflict and hacks just wouldn't compile. Um, so this also is a bit problematic. Um, so, uh, like I said, none of these solutions are as convenient or as automatic as those of other package managers. So I would say that it's not very good in hacks. Um, so, now I'm going to discuss some existing solutions to this problem. Um, so uh, the the most popular one is Lex, which is a a pretty good a pretty good um, alternative to Hackslip, and it's very specific with the with the library version tracking. So um, you won't be able to use a you won't be able to accidentally use an incorrect commit for a library installed through github um, because it installs each commit uh, in a separate directory um, and it also tracks the compiler version as well so that's a that's a important feature for a lot of people especially um, because recently there have been some breaking changes and hacks which weren't necessarily in um, major releases so so yeah it's it's a very good tool however it does have some issues uh, namely that it depends on node.js um, and npm um, which is a bit inconvenient for some people um, it just feels weird installing a package manager for a language using a package manager for another language. Uh, and it also messes with the global hacks installation. This is kind of necessary so that it can, uh, it can keep track of the hacks compiler versions and switch between them. However, uh, because it's not the default way that things work with uh, hacks, it's kind of 
uncomfortable for some people. Um, there's also hmm.json. Uh, this is a bit, uh, a bit of a more simple project, uh, and essentially it just it's a command line tool that just lets you um, manage your. It lets you lock your libraries that you're going to use in your project. Um, however, it's completely separate from Haxib. It doesn't integrate itself into the library resolution system the way Lex does. It just uh, it just works as an external tool, which allows you to install the correct versions for the libraries, and it doesn't really check that you're using those versions. It just um, assumes that you've installed the correct ones using the tool, um, and also it's not as because it doesn't. Um, uh, change the hacks installation at all. It doesn't use anything like Lix does. It can't handle compiler versions as well as library versions. Um, another solution that a lot of people like is Git sub modules. So uh, it's quite popular for car people um, to use Git sub modules in their projects. And it's it's a pretty good solution. It allows you to track all libraries like to the exact comet and it's built into your version control system. However, you cannot really use libraries from the Hackslib database. They all have to be from GitHub or Git. And also, uh, this is a bit more of a uh, a specific issue and most people probably won't run into this. But uh, when you include a library in uh, in hacks, it adds a few compiler flags um, that are kind of usually um, not noticed, but they might include macros for the library, or uh, they also include a flag for the library name and the library version. And if you just you do the naive solution of um, just adding the class path for the library in the sub module uh, to your project, then it won't handle all of this stuff. Um, so that's a bit of an issue, but I mean, depending on your how you use the library, you might not even notice it. However, it can be automated, and I, I made a project to uh, demonstrate this. Um, so if anyone is interested in using Git sub modules to manage their dependencies, um, hopefully that can help you out. Um, so why is there so many solutions to this problem that don't actually address the issues with Haxib, but instead create an, a new solution? Um, and the short answer is that the, the code for Haxib was pretty bad. Uh, kind of still is, I guess. Um, there was a massive main.hx file, which had almost 2,000 lines. And this is where most of the client uh, behavior was stored. And there was a lot of spaghetti uh, code, uh, which happens as a project grows. Um, and obviously, the worse the code gets in a project, the the fewer people are willing to um, to actually address the problem um, and fix it. So it kind of just got left as it is. There were a few um, there were a few issues that were opened to kind of uh, try to address this refactoring issue, but um, none of them ever go anywhere. So in, um, we were left with this not very good code base that no one really wanted to touch. Um, so that's mainly why um, most people decided to, um, like uh, like the people who made Lex, they, one, uh, Yura used to work on um, Hackslib, but he decided that he didn't, um, he didn't think Hackslib could be saved, so he made Lex. Um, and also, um, this is more of a speculative point, but maybe some people 
um, were tired of the legacy hacks lib behaviors that they had to um, deal with. So, for example, um, this is probably more of a minor example, but um, when the hacks lib uh, creates a folder for a library, it will change the periods in the library name to commas, which is a bit weird and in the past has caused some ID um, file searching issues. Um, but stuff like that, you can't really change very easily. Um, and moving to a new project, which doesn't have to comply with those um, legacy standards is a solution to that. Um, so can we fix Hackslib and have a, a usable uh, library management system in Hackslib as it is? Um, well, there was a plan to do this. Um, however, this was two years ago. And you, you can read it if you like. It's This is the link to it. Uh, it goes into some detail. Um, however, it's not complete and um, no one really ended up implementing it. Um, so it's kind of, again, been abandoned. Um, so I decided um, that all of this stuff has been kind of almost happening and then fading away. So I decided that I would try to contribute myself um, because that seems to be the best way to get something out of hacks. Um, so the first step to being able to kind of uh, um, pave the way for this better library management system was to finally refactor Hackslib. So um, this would allow um, well, first of all, the Hackslib code would be more maintainable and cleaner, but also there would be a proper library API. So um, one of the problems currently with with the way Hacks resolves libraries is that it has to, the compiler has to call Hackslib to resolve it. However, um, if the if there was a proper library API for Hackslib, then this could be done without having to create a Hackslib process just to get the library flags. So I, I started working on this refactoring and um, there were a lot of issues that came up in the meantime. Um, however, so, so it wasn't an easy thing. Uh, and there was like some design decisions that had to be made. Um, and eventually I got Simon to have a look at it. And um, a year after I started working on it, um, probably not, not uh, probably a few days after we finished like doing all the reviews, uh, it got merged. So uh, the results of this uh, refactoring are that um, Hexit behavior can now be reused in other projects directly for a library API instead of calling hackslib um, through a shell. So this is quite useful for um, for tools like IDEs and um, Ian Harrigan used to have this hackslib UI project, which just lets you manage your, ha your hackslibs in a UI, in a GUI. And um, stuff like that could be remade um, just using this library API. Which would make which would make a lot of things much simpler, um, and hopefully, I mean, it depends on the quality of the code now. But hopefully, people are a bit more inclined to contribute to Hackslip now that the code is kind of a bit more clean. Um, another result of this is that a lot of bugs were found, which resulted from the, um, the spaghetti code. Uh, that used to plague the Hackslib repo. Um, so a lot of these bugs could be fixed and 
one of the main examples is that um, Hackslib names, so um, names for libraries in Hackslib used to be um, kind of half case sensitive and half case insensitive uh, on Linux. However, now they properly work, or at least on the client, um, you can, uh, when calling a lib in your project, you can do it um, without having to worry about the capitalization of the library name. So that's um, that was uh, possible because the the code was refactored and there was a um, there was a abstract type created for the um, project name. So again, it just um, it just made me aware that there was this issue and uh, I was able to um, fix this issue. Um, so also another um, another result of um, all of this is that while refactoring, um, I made some abstractions um, to the library resolution uh, code. Um, which would allow for future uh, changes to the library resolution system. So for example, libraries could be resolved uh, in a local scope so that um, you could have something similar to Lix where um, the library versions are tracked inside the project. Um, so now, now that I've done the refactoring, and it's been merged into the uh, main branch. I I am working on a, a few improvements, uh, which are now possible. Um, so one of them is uh, uh, to be able to use uh, Git libraries in a slightly smarter way. Um, so for example, to avoid um, having to clone the entire Git history for the repository um and also uh this kind of links into the previous point but also to um have a better system for detecting whether a library needs to be updated because right now there's some confusing messages um when you try to update a git library um so that's one of the things uh i'm trying to work on um, I'm also trying to work on implementing local library scopes, uh, and this is uh, this is an example of a of a library scope file. Um, so this is created using a um, a local version of Hacks that I have. Um, so it tracks, uh, as you can see, all the Git's commit um ids and all the urls so this would kind of solve the whole library version tracking uh, problem um, and hopefully i'll be able to clean these up and make prs soon so that other people can um have a look and um you know review the code and um make any suggestions and then we can see if we can finally um, fix this age-old problem. So for what, what we might be able to do in the future, um, we could try to, as, as described in the, in the hacks, uh, hacks, the hacks compiler plan I mentioned earlier, uh, we could, um, we could have a, a hack sim like wrapper for hacks compiler calls. Um, so this was, I actually tried to start working on this um, before all of this. However, then I realized that Hackslib is, the state with Hackslib uh, currently, with the state Hackslib is in currently, um, that would have to be fixed first before any of this other stuff can be done. Um, so essentially what this would do is it would, um, a create a, a create a front end to the compiler um, and that that allows for this this front end would resolve libraries 
before they're passed on to the compiler and also resolve the compiler version. So then we would be able to um, track uh, compiler versions like Lix does um, uh, in a way that's built into hacks, hopefully. Um, uh, so yeah, um, hopefully eventually we can finally have a built-in um, kind of default solution to dependency management and hacks um, and be able to manage uh, compiler versions as well. Um, so the next uh, thing I wanted to talk about was password security. Um, you might think that um, you're happy with hacks the better it is and you, like, you can kind of forgive the the missing features as long as it gets the basics down like um having a secure method for storing passwords um however unfortunately um that wasn't really the case um so in 2016 um nadako made a opened an issue in the hack slip saying um that we need to stop using md5 for passwords um and with this kind of imperative title to the issue, you'd hope that it would kind of cause a, a bit of a stir and that people would start discussing um, solutions to this and that something would happen. Um, and that kind of was the case. So in a few hours, there were already five replies um, and suggestions um, to how we could uh, address this issue. However, after those five replies, there was pretty much nothing. Um, luckily, um, really unique name did add the server label, so we can't say it was completely inactive. Um, however, the discussion kind of died down. Um, so this became relevant uh, in the Hacks Discord. Uh, after a, a discussion about NPM, which had a security issue where um, accounts that had emails which had um, which belonged to domains that had expired um, were being compromised because um, new people were uh, claiming the domains and they were able to access the accounts. So um, then um, someone brought up the the security of Hackslip, and um, I I happened to have looked at the issue recently, um, so I mentioned that Hackslip still uses MD5, and that kind of caused the. Well, after that, a lot of people started becoming stressed about Hackslip, so most people um, were recommending using Git submodules or just using libraries straight from Git. Um, so this was quite quite a big issue for a lot of people. Um, um, and there's quite a few fair reasons to be concerned about this. Uh, one, that the hacks community is growing. Um, so, I mean, this is true all the time, but we've had every time a new game comes out um, in hacks, which um, which is which is made in hacks, um, and people know that it's made in hacks. Um, uh, it obviously draws more attention to hacks, and uh, more like regular users come to it. So uh, it's important that as the community grows, we're also improving our security. Um, another reason to be concerned is that uh, because of macros libraries can execute arbitrary code as soon as they're included in a project. Um, so if someone managed to gain access to a library author's account and change the contents of the library, then they could run arbitrary code on someone's machine or whoever, whoever happens to install the malicious version. Um, and also, it's also a problem because versions of libraries that have already been released can actually be overwritten right now. Um, so if you release a, um, 
a version, let's say 1.8.0, and you, you accidentally made a typo or something like that, then right now you can actually um, just overwrite the existing version with the new version, um, which um, is really not recommended. Um, but it is an issue that um, we have to deal with. Um, so as this was quite a, a big issue and it seems like nothing was being done, I at one point I jokingly said that um, one of us is going to have to learn how to hash passwords at some point. Um, and when I said this, I was I was genuinely saying it as a joke, but in the end I did um, decide to try to create a proposal to the solution to solve the problem. Um, so first I investigated the current situation, um, along with the people in the, in the GitHub issue thread. So, uh, as it turns out, um, well, we already knew this, but ha hashing is done with, um, MD5, uh, currently for passwords and there is no salt used. So this is quite, um, this is quite bad. It's, it makes the passwords really insecure. Um, and, uh, since hashing is done client side and no hashing is done on the server, um, st storing the hashes as we do now is basically like storing plain text passwords. Uh, because if someone got access to the database, um, then they'd, they'd be able to access people's accounts. Um, and also there is no, currently no password resetting functionality, which is a, a, a bit of an issue, um, because it makes like, if we wanted to reset the passwords to solve this problem, we wouldn't be able to do that right now. Um, so now I'm going to go through the, um, solutions. I might, um, go through them a bit, um, quicker um than anticipated because it seems like i've taken a bit of time um but the first solution was to reset all of the passwords and force users to create new passwords and this would allow uh all all of the md5 hashes to be gone immediately so we would no longer have that vulnerability um um however this is a bit forceful and um simon was saying that he doesn't really want to force um people to uh, do something like this as it would interrupt the workflow and also another issue is that some people might have lost access to their accounts if their emails are no longer um, in use so the second solution was to politely ask users to update their passwords. Um, the pros were that no one would be forced to do anything. No one would be interrupted. Well, they'd be prompted, but not interrupted. And uh, eventually most active accounts would no longer depend on the MD5 hashes. Um, and possibly users would be able to keep using the old Hexo clients until they update their passwords. Um, however, we'd have to, um, we'd have to implement the email based password reset functionality as before, before we'd be able to solve this problem. And, um, because some users may never update their passwords would be vulnerable forever. Um, and also we can only prompt users who actively upload libraries and we'd also have to, uh, reveal which accounts are still using MD5, um, in order so that the client can send the correct, uh, thing to the server. Um, and then I didn't really like either of those solutions. So I, um, I, I did what I should have done at the beginning. I searched on Google, what other open source projects I've done. Um, and I found this pretty good solution, um, which is to gradually migrate, uh, the password hashes. So what's done is that we immediately, uh, rehash all of the existing passwords 
and um with the new algorithm uh, so, sorry we rehashed the md5 hashes with the new algorithm as a temporary measure and then whenever someone logs in we uh, we properly update it to no longer rely on md5 at all um, so this would make all accounts immediately more secure uh, users won't have to do anything on their part um, eventually well most accounts won't depend on md5 and it will if we do this then uh it would take uh it would take kind of an update system to do this which would make future password uh, hash upgrades easy to do um the the slight problems with the solution are that um rehashed passwords are susceptible to password shucking. I'm not going to go into this because it's really confusing and counterintuitive. But um, if you'd like, you can read that link, which explains it. Uh, but essentially, it means that because we've rehashed the MD5 with the other algorithm, um, the MD5 makes it less secure than if we just directly hashed it with the new algorithm um so yeah well, the, all of these uh solutions um require dropping support for register and submit commands at some point for old clients um and this is the case with this one as well um so there was one more solution proposed um, however, I'm not going to spend too much time on it um, because I'm running out of time. Um, but essentially, it was to also keep the client side hashing um, as well as the server side hashing in Axlib. Um, however, this would cause future problems. We'd have to break compatibility every time we um, every time we want to upgrade the hash method. Um, however, it would protect uh, users if there was a bad actor who had access to the server or if the there was some sort of accidental logging going on of passwords because there would be no plain text uh, passwords sent to the server. Um, so uh, I've... I've gone ahead and I've started um, working on solution three, which is um, the the gradual migration um, without the client side hashing, um, and it's not complete yet. But um, there's a few things left to do, and hopefully um, it will kind of guide us in the right direction at least and eventually we can um, come to an agreement about whether the client side hashing is something we want to do or not. Um, so what's left to do is to figure out a few details about updating the existing hashes and also decide on the exact parameters for argon 2 id which is the hashing algorithm I ended up using um, in this uh, branch. Um, so that's one of the things that if anyone has experience with uh, password hashing um, and like deciding on these parameters, then it would be a, a welcome thing to contribute um, if you can um, so that we can decide on these parameters because uh, essentially there are parameters that you can add to this algorithm um, that allow you to make a balance between uh, performance and uh, security. So um, for users, uh, all they need to know, um, well, if if this, um, if solution free is implemented, then they won't have to, regular users who just download other people's libraries um, can continue using Hackslip as normal um, with more security. Um, however, library authors will have to make sure eventually that they're running an up-to-date client to be able to register or submit libraries um, because those two uh, features will be disabled for old clients. Um, and to update, you run Hackslib, install Hackslib, but hopefully you should, um, hopefully 
however you install hacks should also take care of updating hackslip. And then in the future, it would be good to finally implement the password reset functionality and also two-factor authentication um, to be completely, well, not completely, but um, much more um, in line with other um, uh, package manager database security levels. All right, so I don't think there'll be time for questions, but uh, if you want to uh, get, into, get into contact with me, my GitHub is here, and yeah. Thank you very much, and I would like to take a moment to also say thank you for all the work you've been doing, because Hex has a long history of people coming from somewhere, taking ownership yeah. of a specific problem, and having the not only the skill but also the drive and the resolve to actually fix that problem especially in cases like hexlib where if i hear hexlib i still get this twitch in my eye where i'm like <laughs> ugh, it's hexlib and it's really good and also necessary to have people like you who do this kind of work because i mean i know, don't know how much fun it is for you to do this kind of work <laughs> but usually cleaning up the mess of somebody else is much less fun than yeah. like starting a new project where everything is clean and full of fairy dust and that kind of stuff so yes we are very grateful that you're doing this and i hope we'll get hex slip to a state where everyone or most people at least are happy with it and i yeah. look forward to the future work on this and yeah the chat there were some remarks about what we could do regarding all this i'd say we should probably do that kind of discussion in the github issues because discussion discussing the cryptography stuff and this on um, twitch streams tends to be not very uh fruitful so yeah i guess that's it and thank you very, thank much. You very much and we'll take another short break and then i'll talk about the next compiler. See you then.